Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I'm very grateful for the invitation, particularly as it seems to me that the politics of Dionysus has been rejected. So this is a very good theme. Now, I'm going to talk about Euripides' Bacchae, and I have written this commentary on the Bacchae, and the Bacchae has been subject to endless scholarship and interpretation, but there are, I think, new things to be said, particularly in the realm of politics, which is like that politics has been neglected in the study of Dionysiac cult generally, so particularly it has, I think, also in the study of the Bacchae. And I am guilty of that too in my commentary. I didn't say as much about the politics as I should have done. Now, a certain amount of what I'm going to say is unfortunately negative because I'm going to attack a preconceived conception of the Bacchae and of Dionysiac cult, which is extraordinarily widespread. It is what I call a metaphysical preconception. The preconception is that the Bacchae is about irresolvable contradiction. That's the preconception. And if I say, as I'm going to, that that is nonsense, it's rather like if you, if you were to go to Byzantium in the 14th century and maintain the truth of the Western conception of the Trinity, you wouldn't get very far. You would be considered to be a heretic. But there's not much you could do about it, because everybody believes in the Greek Orthodox conception of the Trinity. It really is a... a, a if I were to do, go to a conference in North America and give this paper, people would think I would be slightly mad. Um, because it's a kind of groupthink. It's a kind of collective feeling that this is what the play is about. And for me, it's not just nonsense, it is destructive nonsense, and the kind of nonsense that gets in the way of us understanding what this play is really about, and it's an even more fascinating play that, than people think. One of the problems about the preconception of irresolvable contradiction, as I call it, is it's actually very boring, <laughs> quite apart from the fact that it has nothing to do with the play at all, as we will see, I hope as we go on. The Bacchae is about the arrival of the god Dionysus in Thebes, his rejection by the king of Thebes, Pentheus, and his family, and the victory of Dionysus over Pentheus, and the ultimate establishment of the cult of Dionysus at Thebes. That is what Dionysus says he's going to do when he comes in disguise and delivers the prologue. Now, the resistance of Pentheus leads eventually to violent conflict in which Pentheus is torn apart by his own mother and her female associates who have been sent to the mountainside by the god Dionysus in an ecstasy to perform ritual and dancing in his cult as a prefiguration of what will happen every year in a more controlled way in the performance of the cult of Dionysus. That's what happens in the play, but probably many of you know already what happens in that play. And at the end you see a very cruel scene in which a Gawi who's in a frenzy comes back from the mountains carrying the head of her son and thinking it's the head of a lion that she's just torn apart. She's gradually brought to believe that this is in fact the head of her son. Um, and Dionysus appears ex machina at the end of the play, the god himself, and says, well, you rejected me. This is what I've done to take my revenge on you and establish the cult of Dionysus in Thebes. And he um, says to the uh, royal family, you have to go into exile. But clearly he also says, my cult is now established in Thebes. So that is 100% certain, even though unfortunately that part of the play has been lost that it is 100, not 99%, 100% certain that he does what he said he would do in the prologue, which is to establish his cult in Thebes. So this is, this is the dramatization of what is called an ideological myth. The Greeks perform cult, and if you ask them, why are you performing this cult, they would tell you a story that a long time ago, this is what happened. And very often that ideological myth involves resistance to the cult. Initially there is resistance to the cult, but finally, the resistance is overcome and the cult is established. There are many, many 
examples of this. Now I want to turn to this stuff on the handout produced by eminent scholars and just go through some of these passages. Um, and this all embodies the same basic metaphysical preconception which gets in the way of understanding this play. In one sense, the play is quite simple. The play is telling you that the cult of Dionysus must not be resisted, that everybody must join in. And the play was actually written for and produced at a festival of Dionysus because Dionysus was the god of drama who brought everybody together in the city to watch these dramas or at least participate in these great processions through the city that preceded the dramas. So um, uh, that is what the play is about. And it's about the, the, uh, the resistance to that initially by Pentheus, who incidentally is not a tragic hero, there's no such thing as a tragic hero. Let me repeat that, just in case you think I'm slightly crazy. There is no such thing as a tragic hero. The word hero in tragedy hardly occurs, and it never refers to a living human being. It's only a dead person who receives cult. Aristotle in the Poetics doesn't talk about the tragic hero. It's invented in the Renaissance, but it gets in the way again, of our understanding tragedy, because we think that the individual at the centre of tragedy is somehow heroic. No, the individual at the centre of tragedy is very often called a tyrannos. Over 150 times you get that word or its cognates. Tyrannos means tyrant. So we shouldn't talk about tragic heroes, we should talk about tragic tyrants. The reason it's called hero is either a, a result or a, certainly a cause of a kind of depoliticization of tragedy. You remove the element of tyranny from it. You call, it, you call the person a hero. It's nonsense. There is no such thing as a tragic hero. Uh, right, now, um, here we have Donald Mastronade, who's, who works in California, written a big book on Euripides. Philip said earlier, apropos of the last presentation, he said, if you only read literature, you miss a lot. Well, that's for sure. And that's particularly true in the cult of Dionysus. And these are people, particularly in North America, who only read literature. I really assure you, this is, this is what it's like. They fetishize it. They make it into something which is entirely self-contained. And it makes it a lot easier, by the way. And it gives them their subject. This is literature. And I'm not going to hear of all this other stuff. And that's the kind of organization of the academy, particularly in North America. Um, so here's Mastronade. The tragic dilemma it, the Baki, presents is that one must both acknowledge Dionysus' divinity and recognize the gods' potential for cruel violence and amoral excess. Now this is a problem within the cult of Dionysus. The cult of Dionysus, he's saying, is ambivalent. You have to accept Dionysus because he's a god, but he is very cruel. So you have what he calls a dilemma. There is no dilemma. This is a man who hasn't made the first effort to understand Greek religion. The point about Greek religion is that if you ignore a god or reject a god, they will destroy you. It's simple. That's how it works, right? That's true of every god. There's no dilemma, Donald. This is ridiculous. This is absolutely absurd. And of course, Dionysus, Dionysus <coughs> destroys his enemies because they have rejected him totally. This is what happens. Right, so there's Mastronale. Now, Charles Siegel, who belongs to the same school of literature-only criticism. The relation of civilized humanity to Dionysus and to all that Dionysus symbolizes is necessarily ambiguous. The Baki explores that ambiguity in its tragic dimension and in its relation to tragedy. It is an oversimplification to view the play as a statement either for or against Dionysus and his cult. People in North America and generally find that enormously appealing. No need to make your mind up, well, about anything really, but particularly not the cult of Dionysus. It's ambivalent. It's ambiguous. Anybody who says that this shows a cult of Dionysus 
is bad or good is oversimplifying the worst sin that an academic can be guilty of, oversimplification. The complex will always trump the simple in the mind of these people. Okay, now there's Winnington Ingram. Winnington Ingram is a rather different kind of person. To be sure, he's a literature-only person, um, but he's British for a start. And secondly, he's an older generation. Anybody less um, likely to come from a, a background favorable to Dionysiac cult, you can't imagine. His father was an admiral, and his uncle was an Anglican bishop. Such people do not like ecstatic religion. And moreover, he experienced the, first, the Second World War, and in his preface, he refers to what to Nazism, and he's thinking of the Nuremberg rallies and so on, as one of the terrible examples of a kind of group ecstasy. So Nazism has combined with his, his uh, upbringing to produce an antipathy to Dionysiac cult. And he says, the choral minads, that's, those are the minads that have been sent onto the mountainside, are attempting to introduce their worship into a civilized community to which the Dionysiac in its pure form is inimical. And he gives us an example of that. The, the villagers, the, the Theban minads, I'm sorry, the choral minads are the, the people actually in front of you on stage who've come with Dionysus to Thebes. The Theban Minads are out on the mountainside and they've attacked certain villages. And it's those Minads who are um, uh, described by Winnet and Ingram as the enemies of organized society. So he's pursuing the ambivalence. It's perhaps not even ambivalence. He just thinks that Dionysiac cult is shown in Euripides to be an enemy to civilized society and a terrible thing generally. What he doesn't mention, again, is the fact that these minads on the mountainside are actually performing the cult very peacefully. The, they're described as a thauma eucosmias, a miracle of good order. A honey and milk and wine are flowing from the ground and so on, and, and they're having a lovely peaceful time. But then they're attacked. They're attacked by some men who want to gratify the Turanos Pentheus because Pentheus is rejecting the Dionysian cult. And it's because they're attacked that they attack in return. And indeed, they defeat the men. These are women who defeat the men. They're attacking the villagers. And Winnie Ingram just leaves that out. That's, they only attack the villagers because they are being attacked. Once again, it's a bad idea to attack religious ritual. It's a bad idea to attack a god. Now, this is sort of obvious, um, but the preconceptions are much more powerful than the evidence, as, as always. In fact, I mean, there are other myths of this kind. For example, it was said that at the Thesmophoria, which was a festival of Demeter, a king, Battus, spied on them, on the women. No men were allowed <coughs> in this ritual, one of those women-only rituals, that Battus uh, spied on them and was grabbed by the women and castrated. Well, nobody says that this means that the cult of Demeter was somehow inimical to civilization. That's what happens to you if you spy on the women. Uh, you, there have to be these sanctions that women actually maintain against men who intrude on their rituals. That would be regarded as perfectly reasonable. Okay. Now we come on, in passage four, to the most sophisticated of the uh, embodiments of the PIC, the preconception of irresolvable contradiction. Because this man does know about religion. This is Henk Schnell. He's very good, actually, in certain respects, in writing about Greek religion. And he has a new take on the Baki. And he, what he's noticed, interestingly, is that in Athens in the 5th and 4th centuries BC, there were a number of new cults introduced of foreign deities, Kibale, Bendis, Sabasius, Isodites and so on. And some of them we know uh, from sources, older sources, or sometimes it's later sources like Scoliasts, is that um, they're, they're initially resisted. There is hostility to these cults by the <laughs> Athenians because of certain goings on. They think they involve drunkenness and immorality and sex and so on. And the action is taken against them. Um, however, in almost all cases, they are nevertheless established. The cult of Kibale was established, had an official position eventually after the priest of Kibale who arrived 
was killed by the Athenians, there was then a plague, and an oracle was consulted, and they said, you must establish the cult. So the cult of Kibbele was established after the initial resistance. That's an ideological myth. It doesn't look like history to me. Something similar may have happened, but that's an example of an ideological myth. God, foreign deities introduced resistance, violence against the priest, plague, followed by oracle, followed by the establishment of the cult. And there are a number of other cults of this kind. And Chanel says, quite rightly, well, actually what Pentheus says is rather like what these Athenians were saying. This new cult involves sex and drunkenness and general immorality and disorder and so on and so forth. That's fine. And after all, the Baki dramatizes an ideological myth. But he then loses sense completely. And passage 4 shows this. He says, the Baki pictures Dionysus as a new daimon who, being outlawed by the city officials, turns out to be a real great god and thus proves res resistance to be hamartia. Now, that's right, except, except there are no city officials in the Baki, but allowing that small error, the rest of it is perfectly correct. It turns out to be a hamartia, or a sin, or at least a big mistake to resist Dionysus because he is indeed a real great god. Then on the next page, about two sentences later, he says, the tragic paradox lies in the fact that both parties are right. No, no, it doesn't. Some, suddenly you get this metaphysical preconception coming in. No, 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 Pentheus resisted the great god. He wasn't right, he was wrong. It's really quite simple. So how can Fischnell conceivably say, well, it was clearly, it was clearly wrong, that's what the word hamartia means, to resist him, but nevertheless both parties are right. How can that be? Because of the power of preconception. Now, I know what he means, he's pointing to the interesting fact that Pentheus says the sort of things that some Athenians might have said when Kibbele arrived or when Bendis arrived and so on and so forth. But as far as this play is concerned, it's ludicrous to say that both parties are right. Well, what, so what, what's Euripides trying to do? Euripides, he says, intended to leave us with a sense of uncertainty. Why? Now, this is absolutely fashionable in certain circles about Greek tragedy. It's all interrogative. You end with uncertainty, aporia. It's all interrogative. It doesn't provide any answers. It doesn't say anything. Oh, horror. What a horror would be he actually said anything. No, it's all interrogative. These people tend to adopt this principle generally in politics and so on and so forth. They certainly adopt it ferociously when it comes to Greek tragedy. The Oresteia ends with a big question mark. That's what these Athenians really want, you see, because they're, it's true that their polis is disintegrating and they're quite likely to all to be slaughtered and so on. But nevertheless, what they really like is going to the theatre and being presented with unanswerable questions. That's, according to these people, that's what Euripides and Aeschylus are interested in and that's what the tragedies give you. And it is total nonsense. Now, um, here, to follow it up more closely, Fersnell says, paradox is the opposition between the wisdom of accepting Dionysus, he uses the word paradox, and another wisdom, here we go, the sophrosune, that's moderation, self-control, the sophrosune of Pentheus, who represents the equally credible and justifiable civic resistance to a new religion that shakes the pillar of society. Well, no, no, it, it just, this is not a justifiable civic resistance. It's a big mistake. It is not justifiable. He thinks it's justifiable and it resembles some things that Athenians may have said about gods who were eventually of course accepted as Dionysus is, but it is not justifiable. There is no paradox whatsoever. But he uses the word sophrosune. Limit, now, if we, I looked up the occurrence of the word sophra. Sophrosune doesn't fit into the meter metrically, but you have this word sophro in which the word sophrosune comes from, which means moderate, self-controlled, self-limiting. It occurs in the Baki ten times. Not once is it used of Pentheus. It, most of the occurrences are about the Dionysiac cult itself, as being so thrown. In some cases, somebody is wishing Pentheus was more so thrown. Um, 
who clearly isn't so thrown. And uh, there are passages, two passages where the messenger is saying, the Minads, they're so thrown, not as you think, they're not getting drunk, they're so thrown. So all the sophrosyne attack, attaches to the cult, and none of it attacks, mm -hmm. attaches to Pentheus. And yet we have Fechnel saying, there is the sophrosyne of Pentheus. What is he talking about? Pentheus appears on stage initially, and as he appears on stage, it's said of him, hos eptoetai, what a flutter is he in. And he then delivers this rant against Dionysus. He then tries to lock Dionysus up. He gets into an extraordinary um, uh, process which is, occurs inside the house, which is described, which he rushes around, calling for water, jabbing <coughs> at, at, at lights, and, and so on. Pentheus is the opposite of Sophrone, of Sophrone from the beginning. The chorus are the embodiment of Sophrosyne. And, of course, the part of the preconception is to imagine that ecstatic dancing is um, somehow the opposite of sofra. Dionysiac dancing, you see it on glass paintings, is the opposite of sofra. And anybody who's ruling a, 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 a city-state must somehow embody civic order. And that, that, that's a sort of deep, unconscious political preconception. So what is Pentheus, then? Pentheus, as I say, is not a hero. He is a Turanos. He's called a Turanos. And as everybody says in another play, there's nothing more hostile to a polis than a Turanos. When Pentheus is dead, his grandfather Cadmus delivers a eulogy of him, in which he not once says Pentheus was a good ruler. Not once does he say he, he kept order in the polis. He says, you looked after me, your grandfather, and you were a tarbos to the polis. You were a terror to the polis. That's Pentheus's relationship to the polis. The Athenians were extremely hostile to tyranny all the way through the 5th century. There are endless texts in which they express their fear and detestation of tyranny. That should be borne in mind when you see all these tragic characters called tyrannos. In fact, in the very festival in which the dramas were performed, they had an announcement all the way through until at least the time of Aristophanes, who mentions it, offering a reward to anybody who kills the Turanoi. That's at the dramatic festival. That's incredible. Um, so, so that's, that's uh, Vashnel. Um, so you have then an uh, irresolvable contradiction, supposedly, between Pentheus is supposed to embody civic order and the Dionysiac cult is somehow opposed to it. Um, and that's an irresolvable contradiction because Dionysus is also a god. And then you um, also have this contradiction even within Dionysiac cult. And both those contradictions are pure illusion. Neither of those contradictions are irresolvable. Of course, ambivalence and contradiction is important in tragedy, but it is almost always functional. It has a point. It's not there just to be celebrated as contradiction. Right, now, um, <coughs> one more passage before I end up with Nietzsche. This is passage five. Dionysus represents power that has to be both abhorred and worshipped. This tragic situation is made clear in Euripides' Bacchae. A Gawi completely surrenders herself to the god and is punished by unwittingly slaying her son and being banished while the opposite attitude of Pentheus, who resists the god, leads to his violent death. Perfect example of the preconception of irresolvable contradiction from Audemars and Ladinla, who are Dutch. Now, um, he says, it looks impressive, that a Gawi completely surrenders herself to the god and is punished by unwittingly slaying her son. That looks unfair, doesn't it? That, that tells you that Dionysus is implacable, cruel, and irrational. He punishes the people who follow him. <coughs> Unfortunately, they've omitted to notice an absolutely crucial passage in the prologue of the play, which Dionysus comes on and says, <coughs> I've been rejected here. And in particular, he says, well, Pentheus is rejecting me, but also my mother's sisters. And he means Agawi and her sisters. They rejected me, and they, they said that when their sister Semele said that she'd had sex with Zeus and I was the product of it, they didn't believe her. And they said, 
that she'd had sex with some man and made up the story that she'd had sex with Zeus. Actually, of course, that's not an unreasonable thing to think. But in this case, it's manifestly untrue. Dionysus is the son of Zeus. So Agawi has done the worst possible thing. So have her sisters. He then says, Toigar, therefore, he says, just in order to, as it were, ensure that he wouldn't be understood 2,000 years later by people like Adamans and Ludenwa, he says, therefore, I have driven them crazy and set them up onto the mountainside. So the idea that Agawi is somehow innocent, is preposterous. So once again, you've got nonsense in the interests of the preconception of irresolvable contradiction. And until I get to Nietzsche, that's uh, my last passage. Of course, what happens in the play is that the royal family are exiled, the tyrannical family are exiled, and the polis gets the benefit of the cult. That's a very common ending for Greek tragedy. Now, um, a thing that in my commentary I didn't pay enough attention to was the immediate political circumstances of the play, which I think strengthens my case that the Athenians are not as interested in irresolvable contradiction as people like Charles Siegel are. Um, the fact is that Euripides died in the winter of 407 to 406 BCE. And this play was one of his very last plays. It was never produced in his lifetime. It was produced after he died. But we don't know where and when. Probably in Athens, but we don't know when. But he wrote it almost certainly in the years after 412, 407. And that was after the catastrophic Sicilian expedition in which thereafter Athens was plunged for all those years into severe internal conflict which represented an existential threat because the Spartans were ready to come in and destroy them. They needed to be united, but they couldn't manage to be united. They were divided into the rich against the poor. There were constitutional changes, and eventually in 404, a group of 30 people seized power. After Euripides died, but a natural consequence of what was going on. And there's one episode described by Xenophon which is, nobody's noticed, actually very important, I think, for understanding the battle. <laughs> because there's a battle between the supporters of the 30, who are called, who Xenophon says they thought they could tyrannize, they thought they could behave like tyrannoi, like tyrants, these 30 people. And then on the other side, there are Democrats. And they come to, to have a battle. Um, and Xenophon described, the Democrats win it, actually, in the end. It's the beginning of the end of the 30. <laughs> But uh, <coughs> Xenophon describes the battle, and after the battle, they, they kind of start, the two sides start talking to each other. I mean, they share a language and a culture. And you can imagine, first of all, they fight to a standstill, then they start talking to each other. And the spokesman for the Democrats is a man called Cleocritos, who is, Xenophon says, the herald of the mysteries. That's the Eleusinian mysteries in which most Athenians participated, this enormously emotional collective ritual in which people experience death in order to be rid of the fear of death, and they do it together. This creates solidarity. And you may remember a passage of Herodotus in which the Persians have arrived in, in uh, 480 BC, and the Athenians have abandoned their city, left it empty to the Persians, and uh, eventually they defeat the Persians, but this is the moment of existential threat to Athens. In a sense, it no longer exists, and there is a ghostly procession from Eleusis. It's a divine procession in which a great cloud of dust arises as 30,000 people tramp across the plain. The Athenians, it's not the real Athenians, it's a sort of divine or ghostly procession. What it's saying is, of course, that the gods will save Athens, but, of course, it... It, what it means, sociologically, you might say, is it's the rituals that embody the unity, the spirit, the termination, above all, the unity of the people, particularly this very emotional ritual. When Aristophanes, uh, in 405, writes the frogs, he has a chorus of initiates of Eleusis, who, at the end of the play, send up Aeschylus, a tragic poet, from the underworld, to this world in order to save the polis. So tragedy and mystic initiation are both crucial for saving the polis. Now, to get back to Cleocritus, he is a 
herald of the mysteries. And he says, Xenophon reports, look, we shouldn't be fighting. We're all Athenians. And you, and we share participation in solemn rituals. And he's referring, of course, to the Eleusinian mysteries. So once again, you have... There, you have an opposition between the, the Tyrannos, on the one hand, is using violence for tyrannical rule, and the mysteries which unite everybody, on the other hand. And the Baki, of course, is pervaded, secretly often, because they couldn't be revealed, with the morality, the ritual, the ideas of Dionysiac and Eleusinian mystic initiation. That's what the play is about. But mystic initiation has enormous political significance. This stuff about the immediate context of the play, in which the Athenians have better things to think about than irresolvable contradiction, they have got to think about the unity of the polis and how you create it, is all completely ignored in the vast literature on Euripides' Bacchae. Not only by these people, but I actually didn't mention that passage in my commentary. Uh, if it was the second edition, I would do so. Now, um, finally, with metaphysical contradictions, it's always worth thinking, where do they come from? And I just want to end uh, briefly, if it's brief, by uh, saying something about this. Because you may know that there's a theory of tragedy associated with the philosopher Hegel in the early 19th century, which puts contradiction at the heart of tragedy. Tragedy is about contradiction, but for Hegel it's about the resolution of one-sided contradictions. They collide and out of it comes something superior. Um, the Antigone is his primary exhibit. Contradiction between the state and the family, that contradiction is at the heart of the Antigone. There's dreadful suffering that results from it, but in the end, you, you arrive at some kind of resolution of the contradiction and a higher level of society. And Hegel, of course, believed that the state was the embodiment of the absolute spirit, and um, he uh, spent most of his life engaged in resolving contradiction. I mean, he was born in 1770. He was 19 when the French Revolution started. He remained loyal to the French Revolution throughout his life, but that meant he was constantly facing a big historical contradiction between, on the one hand, the inherited particularities, privileges, rights, practices of the small German states where he had to live, on the other hand, what he could see in the glorious future, which is the universality that arises from the French Revolution and will inform the new modern state. That was precisely the contradiction that he was engaged in and was trying to resolve. And in his attempt to resolve it, he would talk about the one-sidedness of the people who uh, were universalists. They didn't sufficiently recognize the rights of the small states. So his notion of one-sided contradiction is not just part of his theory of tragedy. It's about his profound political engagement. He wrote pamphlets and so on and so forth. Now let's, let's switch to Nietzsche born in 1844, who is the diametric opposite of Hegel in every respect that I've mentioned. He has a lifelong antipathy to what he calls the state and society, which he regards as merely an obstacle to individualism. He, after he gives up his job in Basel in 1879, where he was a professor of Greek for a few years, he lives a very solitary life, moving with a suitcase from one place to another, never settling down, never, of course, being politically engaged in any sense, being hostile to it in every sense. Of course, he had no relationship with a woman, though apparently he did visit brothels. Um, and he writes The Birth of Tragedy, first in 1872. And The Birth of Tragedy represents, interestingly, what I call the reification of contradiction. You have some examples of it in handout number six. That is to say, contradiction is no longer the contradiction of, say, the state and society on the one hand with the family on the other. Um, it's not a contradiction of anything in particular. It's just contradiction. And incidentally, he says that the state and society is completely excluded from the purely religious origins of tragedy. 
So he wants to separate tragedy on the one hand as a metaphysical phenomenon from the state and society on the other. This is total nonsense. I mean, nobody would believe this now, but this is, you know, he was quite young when he wrote it. Uh, but this is a kind of influential nonsense. And, um, of course, there is a, the reification of contradiction means, of course, that it's irresolvable. It's just contradiction. It's what he calls Ur-Widerspruch. And you have the passages in front of you on six, in passage six. Um, so contradiction is reified as a thing separate from any particularities. And it's abstract, it's primordial, and above all, it's irresolvable. So, there, of course, there is a correlation between political disengagement and the taste for irresolvable contradiction, just as there is a <coughs> correlation between the political engagement of Hegel and his imagining tragedy in terms of resolvable contradiction. In this respect, Hegel is much more like the ancient Athenians than Nietzsche is, of course. And modern academics, particularly in, North, particularly in North America, I have to say, are in both these respects, both politically and theoretically, much more like Nietzsche. At that point, I end. Thank you. Thought-provoking conference, and now we we have some minutes for a debate. So maybe I'm sure there are questions. Uh, mm -hmm. so, okay. <coughs> Thank you very much for your comments on the obsession of. Uh, showing Kantic philosophy and tragedy as a field of uh, permanent approximation. That's an obsession which shows us how uh, we project nowadays discussions from the epistemological discussion and looking for a, a, for a, a mandate, for a legitimization of that in the ancient, that's true. Uh, I will risk, that's a risk, which uh, I want to take. It's a smooth apology of a tragic dilemma. That's uh, risky, but it's a wolf. I mean, you thought um, back, it's an ideological myth. That's true, no doubt. The question is only, only, is it only ideological meat? <laughs> uh, or it's something which shows a kind of a permanent temptation? Because I do agree that for Euripides uh, there is no real dilemma. I mean, uh, Dionysus is right and the Pentheus is wrong. It's nothing hidden. Uh, but the story is not only about the past or as about mythical beginning, but I think it's on the permanent temptation to reject Dionysus. Why? Why the temptation exists? Because Dionysus is transcendent. And there is a permanent temptation of rejecting transcendence because of falsely identified political interest. So there is a phenomenon which may be called Pentheus. Pentheus, the human phenomenon. Yes, yes, yes. And the question why and what are the reasons why people follow Pentheian uh, ideas, it's an interesting question, not just a mistake. I mean, it's not only, a, I mean, the play is not only about false and true. It's about the reason why people are false. That's much deeper, I think. Uh, and if the reasons are strong, the tragic dilemma exists. It's a, of course, it's a dilemma between false and true, but it's a dilemma between a strong reason uh, and true. Dilemma between those temptations um, and the imperative of the cult exists, definitely. Not because, of course, both sides are right, that's absolute, I do agree. But because people think it is so. And that's, I think, a topic which may help me to advocate a little bit the tragic dilemma idea. <laughs>
Well, I'm very sympathetic to that, to that observation. I don't think it leads you to a dilemma, but nevertheless, I'm very sympathetic to the observation. And I'll make two points in response. Firstly, um, a political point, uh, which is something that relates to what other people may be saying about the role of Dionysus under imperial systems or monarchical systems. What I've said does, I think, complement at least what Cornelia Isla Keren, you said earlier this morning, who, unlike some people, puts Dionysus right at the heart of the city. Well, so do I, of course, but I do it in a different way. Um, but it's this, that when Tiresias is explaining why the cult of Dionysus should be accepted in the city, uh, he says he desires honours from everybody, without distinctions. Alexa Pantone Bulatai Timas Ekein. Very significant, and it's what it, that's something which we know about Dionysiac cult. There's plenty of evidence from Athens itself that everybody joins in. That's why it's so politically important. Everybody <coughs> joins in without distinctions. It is a symbolic expression of the wholeness of the city. He then says, interestingly, to Pentheus, "You, Pentheus, you know what it's like. You know what it's like when you're at the city gates." And the whole city magnifies the name of Pentheus, Megalune Polis. That's an politically an enormously important thing to say. He then says, well, Dionysus, he too likes being honored. Karkenos oi mai hedetai timomenos. So he's saying, look, there are two individuals here, both of whom want the acclamation all at once of the whole city. And one is Dionysus, and the other is the tyrant <coughs> Pentheus. But the implication is, it isn't drawn out, the implication is it can't be both. The point is, if you're a city, you have to choose either a potentate, a dictator, a tyrannos, a ruler, or an emperor, whom you unite to honor, or a god. And the Athenian democrats, this is a democracy, they choose a god, and they don't want a tyrannos. They don't want a man, they want a god. They want to be united in acclamation a, sin, a single individual, but not a man, a god. Now, that all breaks down, of course. Already at the end of the 4th century BC, you have an episode in which, uh, in which um, Polio, Demetrius Polyorchetes is at a, in the heart of a ritual in which he's worshipped as if he was a god. And then, from then on, either potentates or kings identify with the god, or more likely they they favor the cult of Dionysus because the cult of Dionysus can bring everybody together. That's what they want as kings or as rulers. And sometimes, as in the case of uh, Crassus's, uh, sorry, Plutarch's Life of Antony, which I think Philip is going to talk about Plutarch, uh, Mark Antony enters the city of Ephesus and it's like a Dionysiac festival with Antony in the place of Dionysus. So that, but that dynamic of Dionysus, the people, and the mighty individual is already there in the back of you. So that's an enormously important passage. The other thing I would say is that, yes, because everybody in Athens is a potential Turanos. That's, the, that's how I would put it. Why? Because the Turanos depends on, on control of money. Every individual in Athens has a kind of isolated individualism based on ownership of money. This is a completely new world. You have a new kind of individualism a new kind of individualism, which is embodied in an extreme form by Pentheus, but also in a lesser form by each individual in the audience, just as we are isolated individuals. And in, uh, in the way that in pre-monetary society, people are not. Pentheus accuses Tiresias of telling lies for money when he is um, offered the sight of the miners on the mountainside. He says, oh, yes, I give a lot of money for that. This is the man of money, Midas-like. Um, and so, yes, absolutely, this means something to people, firstly, because they see a Tyrannos being destroyed, which is good, and secondly, because there's a sense in which each and every one of them is a potential Tyrannos. So in that sense, I agree with you completely. That, that's even, Plato says that uh, tyranny is a uh, full realization of a democratic idea. Well, by he, one person, by he one does. Person. I mean, he, actually, he's historically wrong about that in the sense that there was the, the, the only sense in which, um, I mean, he talks about democracy being a sort of 
a sort of anarchy of many, many different ideas and then one of them, and desires, and then one of them takes over. That is not really how tyr that's not how tyranny came, in, came into being. However, um, however, I suppose that, that he might be sympathetic to the sort of thing I've just said. He never says anything quite like that. Yes, but I, I take your point. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you very much for a really wonderful paper. Um, I once, several years ago, sat down and read all of the introductions to commentaries of Euripides' Bacchae, and it transpired that they fell into two categories pro Dionysian, including Euripides, and pro Pentheon, including um, the French commentator Rouve from 1970 1972. And this reminds me of an inspirational paragraph in an essay by Gian Piaggio Conte uh, entitled The Strategy of Contradiction, where he says that when there is disagreement and fundamental disagreement among critics, that this is basically an externalization of a contradiction or a paradox that exists within the text, which has merely taken up residence uh, in the critical debate. So, um, with that in mind, even if all of the critics that you very amusingly satirized have got it wrong, wouldn't you have to accept that they have fallen into a trap uh, that Euripides laid for them? Uh, in particular, that, that already within the play, and I'm thinking in particular of two remarks that Catalyst makes in his uh, argument with the God uh, at the end of the play, they're all, if you like, singing, all of, the, all of the critics, or several of the critics that you talked about are singing off the Cadmus in sheet uh, that the God is excessive in his asymmetrical uh, judgment uh, and that violent response and that gods um, should, or should not resemble um, mortals in their anger. So that's, I suppose, the substance of my point. And as, a, as a footnote to it, um, if you, I haven't published this yet, but I, I conducted a metacritical analysis, uh, a metacritical comparative analysis of interpretations of Euripides' Bacchae and interpretations of Virgil's Aeneid. And there, when you have the killing of Turnus, uh, you have the Harvard School critics uh, who say that this is terrible, and you have the pro critics who say that this is right, and that it's just that it can be justified juridically, philosophically, etc., uh, etc. Et and it's pretty clear to me that the people who justify the killing of Terminus have all of the right arguments on their side. But it's also clear to me that even the people on the other side have to acknowledge that Virgil writes the text in such a way that it's supposed to feel bad. We're supposed to feel a pang of resistance uh, or of contradiction or of something of that kind. So this is just a sort of rambling, roundabout way of saying that um, everything that you satirized can also be supported on the basis of the text. Yes, I mean, I'm actually pretty sympathetic to that. I wouldn't dare to pronounce anything about the Aeneid because that's a completely different socio-political context and therefore, by my own principles, I shouldn't pronounce on the Aeneid. So I'm not going to. <laughs> when it comes to the backing, you, you, that point about, the, well, this is excessive, but then gods, gods shouldn't be like that. I mean, this is made absolutely clear. Let me say that, of, of course, I... Um, allow for the importance of contradiction in tragedy. Uh, but I also think that tragedy is functional. I mean, I'm not a functionalist in every sense, but I do think it's doing things. And it's doing th two things which you might think, we might think, are contradictory. One is to evoke sympathy for the tyrannical family, right? And the ending does do that, clearly. No doubt about that. And the other is to uh, depict... The, the sins, the excesses, and the, and the welcome demise of the tyrannical family which accompanies the establishment of cult for the whole polis. And it does those two things together. And it's, it, it's kind of having the best, having its cake and eating it, is what we in England call cakeism these days, because it characterizes our relationship to negotiating with the European Union in which we want, the, we want all the benefits and have none of the obligations. Uh, anyway, the Athenians have their own form of cakeism, which is they clearly they feel sympathy for the family, but they also rejoice in their demise. 
And there's a particular reason why that happens, um, and I see nothing, con nothing irresolvably contradictory about that. That seems to me a perfectly resolvable contradiction. And it's not, it's, not really, it's not what these people like Siegel are talking about. They're talking about a sort of abstract thing. Um, but the, the particular reason for that, because the, the, the family um, is either destroyed by the gods or it destroys itself. What you don't have in tragedy is the people rising up and getting rid of the tyrannical family. Or one faction within the oligarchy killing another and then becoming rulers. Because if you had that, you, there'd be no closure. That really is no closure. People are obviously banging on about literature not providing closure. It's one of those Californian cliches that we just hear all the time. But um, actually, serious non-closure is not just the inherent in the text, whatever it is, but actually serious non-closure is a matter of revenge, right? Because if you have a violent act and the survivor and the victor survives, you have a problem. To, even at the end of the Odyssey, you can see it's a problem which is pre- Tragic. And therefore you cannot have a situation in which a human victor prevails through violence and survives um, unless, it's, unless the, the victims are barbarians like in, in the Persians. So God has to do it or somebody within the same family has to do it. Right? So that's how you get closure. But that's also, intrafamilial killing is very pathetic. It's, it's terrible. It, it involves all sorts of emotions that we may have had from children concerning hostility to the people around, the, our kin, our, our mother, our father, our brother, and all the rest of it. So all those emotions can be evoked, but in a framework of political expediency. So I, I, I do agree with you about that, but it's not irresolvable contradiction. It's contradiction that makes perfect sense when you think what these Athenians are doing. And the pathos gives them the solidarity of collective lamentation. But at the same time, they're getting rid of the bastards. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. OK, well, I, I mean, I'd be very happy to accept that, but I'd, I'd still want to um, say that there isn't much stress on the celebratory dimension at the end of the play. Well, we don't know, because okay. unfortunately, part of Dionysus' speech has been lost. And there are critics who say, oh, we don't know what happened. Yeah. Of, course he's, of course he founds the cult, and this is a good thing, and this, the, this is something to be welcomed. It is Thebes, of course, so you don't have the terrible sight of all these terrible things happening in Athens. But nevertheless, the cult is established because at the beginning of the play, he says, I have come to establish the cult. What he didn't say at the end of the play was, well, I was going to establish the cult, but on reflection, I don't think I'll bother. No, no, he establishes the cult, right? So that is positive. Thanks a lot for... Question. Unfortunately, we are running out of time for this um, session, so I think we should move on. Uh, okay. thank Professor uh, you can Sifra. ask me afterwards. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, can we learn uh, last question? Or is, uh, no, no, I think it was. Okay, so we move on. Thanks a lot, Professor Sifra, for this. <laughs>